All right, so uh, I'm Brian Cardell. I'm developer advocate at Egalia, and this is a kind of a special edition of the podcast. My colleague, Eric Meyer, who's usually on here with me, is away. So he won't be joining us, but this will be, I think, the 23rd episode. It should have been the nice quarter century number, but there were two that we recorded that we didn't ultimately post for uh, a few reasons. But it's also kind of nice because we're circling back to, again, the very first one of these that we ever did. And the subject is MathML, but with a different twist, which is that it's just shipped in Chrome 109. So I'm joined here by uh, some people from Chrome and MathML. And I don't know, do you want to introduce yourselves? Sure, I'll go first. I'm Rick Byers. I'm a principal engineer on the Chrome team. And uh, I spent a bunch of my career trying to think about how we prioritize stuff on the team and, you know, always been a big fan of the, of the work that happens at Egalia on, on Chromium. Cool. I'll go next. Um, hi, my name's Ian Kilpatrick. Um, I'm a software engineer on the layout team specifically within Blink. Uh, so I spent a lot of time uh, reviewing code from Egalia regarding methanol and very excited to see the shipping. And just, I should have said, Ian and I are are both here kind of in a personal capacity, you know, not, uh, you know, as fans of the web, not really speaking on behalf of Google. Sure, sure. And I'm Neil Seufer. I'm uh, semi-retired now. I do accessibility work with MathML, and I'm one of the co-chairs along with Brian of the MathML Working Group. I got started in MathML uh, a quarter century ago, um, and... uh, when I was working with Wolfram Research back at the very beginning when um, math was uh, just a dream in everyone's eye and a clearly missed opportunity. Um, and I've been pushing forward on it for a very, very long time. So I'm glad to see that I've lived long enough to have uh, have it see the light of day. Um, yeah, it's too bad that this didn't wind up being the nice quarter century 25th uh <laughs> episode because it had been nice bookend with it took about 25 years to get it done (laughs) but uh hey we did it we shipped the thing in the last browser but only kind of actually uh i think as we'll talk in this about you know what it is what we what we did what we're kind of celebrating and where things go now but i think it's like a really banner day to talk about like what is it and why did it take so long to get here and um what you know does it even matter (laughs) um i think that really a lot of people who are listening probably you know shrug a little bit um i think it's very possible for you to spend an entire career um doing things on the web and never think to yourself boy i wish we had math mill so, like, should they care? Is it even relevant to them? Even it's all really interesting topics. But um, maybe Neil could could you give us like a really as brief as you can, like how we got to now? Um, well, twenty five years. I'll try and condense it into twenty five seconds. We'll see. Um, so it was probably back around nineteen ninety seven. Uh, talked to the then heads of the W3C, which included Tim Berners-Lee about trying to get uh, a better situation with math uh, for the web. Um, And we actually had two MathML conferences where convened a lot of people together, a lot of excitement. Um, It started to get into some of the browsers. Uh, There was a plugin for IE that was done by Design Science back around 2004, um, which is that time was probably MathML 2. MathML 3 came out in 2010. At that point, Firefox was uh, now supporting it. Um, And then uh, some bad things happened, which I think Brian can talk about, where MathML showed up briefly uh, and then disappeared from Chrome. and uh, so now we're up to today where MathML Core is getting supported by all the browsers and uh, things have been great um, uh, in the last few years. Math accessibility has been a very bright spot um, for math. It used to be everybody used images and now they use MathML that gives them both speech and braille uh, if you're blind and then 
uh, synchronous highlighting of various parts of the math uh, if you need that for, say, dyslexia. So, um, so there's some really great bright spots there. Yeah. Um, so HTML plus even before MathML, uh, had a proposal and they had experimental support for a way to render math in the CERN experimental browser that was built for HTML plus. So it's really, really a long time, but this weird window that entered and made a lot of progress was also when the W3C was very hip on XML. Everything was reformulated in terms of XML. XML was going to be the future. Like we were going to supplant even HTML would be XML. And that entered this weird time where we had this split with some folks who thought that the regular HTML web should <laughs> carry forward and that created the what wig. And that's the time when uh, we began to get some implementations in the browser that were done by uh volunteers in Firefox was the first one. And that was done as that was being done. It was standardized into the brand new specification for the parser. So SVG and MathML got specially integrated. So they're like very, very special. And they came in this really weird time where HTML itself wasn't very mature. CSS was still like a long way from what it is today and maturing and even JavaScript, the, the DOM APIs were not really fully cooked. And so when uh, Blink split from WebKit, it was wonky. Like the implementation was wonky. Uh, it had some problems and yeah, Google took it out in 2013 uh, and it never got picked back up with priority because, well, it's complicated, right? Prioritization is really, really hard. And the asks of the web are, are kind of everything. So I guess this gets into like, why would you prioritize it, right? Like why, what, to the question of why should people care? And um, part of the reason that I wanted to ask Rick back on was because uh, Rick and Rawson joined me for an earlier episode as well. And it was like during the peak of the pandemic and um, we were discussing how, well, gee, my kids are attending school remotely. This math mail thing could be pretty useful. Um, and, you know, the need to share research and, and, and things that would be thought of with math mail. So I don't know. I mean, I, I think it is really like societally important in ways that are um, maybe more subtle than the need for, I don't know, some way to measure the performance of paint or something, but pretty important. All right, maybe I'll start. So first of all, I want to say congratulations. Um, I think, you know, I know all three of you here, I have not been really involved in MathML itself other than, you know, trying to be a cheerleader and, and I think, you know, uh, on, in the background a little bit. Um, but I, I think you've really accomplished something monumental, not like, yes, I think math, math is a, an important use case. But to me, the more meta thing here is this is the first example I know of that a major, major feature is really coming to the web um, despite there not really being a business case for the businesses who normally advance the web. Like I know I've, I've been impressed before with the Gallia getting grid uh, off the ground, but mm -hmm. grid was a case where, where we could at least argue, hey, making sure the web can build powerful apps that are like our modern – you know, we, we could make a case for why that made sense in the Chrome team to invest some. And this whole, like, how do we prioritize things in different teams? It, it is super hard. It's it's like an impossible problem. There's different opinions about what matters, but there's also different opinions about, like, how, you know, what the cost-benefit trade-offs are going to look like. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I remember early in MathML, uh, I remember when you know, you all were proposing doing it at Gallia and, and like a bunch of us were talking, how can we make, how can we come up with a path where we can say yes? And we were just worried it was going to be a huge job to do it in a way that lived up to the bar we set for interoperability. Um, and, and so I'm just so impressed that, you know, we, that y'all managed to actually pull that off because it must have been, it must have been a, like, it's a huge investment. It was a huge investment over a lot of years. And um, we, um, we did manage to get um, to raise funding through 
uh, many and some unusual means, but also we use it to talk about exactly this this problem, right? Um, so <clears throat> just as an example, you say like the business case isn't there, but I mean, sure it is. <laughs> um, online education is like lucrative. So yeah, that some of that money could be spent on getting uh, native math mail support. Um, <clears throat> There are lots and lots of uh, research organizations that spend lots and lots of tech money and need math. Um, why not? You know. Yes, yeah, I, I think this is. I think this is very much a case of the sort of the tragedy of the commons yeah. economic thing, where everybody else feels that somebody else should pay for it. Um, you have publishers that have math textbooks that wanted to put it online. Um, you had uh, uh, one case, I know we did a proposal to the NSF to get the NSF to fund it because it's important for scientific research, but it uh, wasn't really quite their domain to do it either. So it just kind of gets bounced around from one place to another. But um, I'm really glad that Agalia stepped up and some other people stepped up and got the funding going to, to make this happen because everybody else was waiting for other people to do it. I think that's exactly right, Neil. I, I think I think we fall into this tragedy of the commons problem a lot. And, and I know from the outside, it's easy to think, oh, Google has infinite money, the Chrome team has infinite resources. But honestly, from the inside, everything we say yes to, it's something that we're going to say no to. Right, we got to decide what is what's not going to happen in order to make this happen, and and you know some of us talked about how could we make that case for MathML and just looking at the cost of it, we we just couldn't put forth a credible argument for what we weren't going to do in order to do MathML, and maybe that was a failure of you know uh, creativity on our side. Maybe we screwed up to you know not being able to you know make make that case and find the right partnerships to do it. Um, but this is a constant struggle for us for 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 how to make how to make that. Uh, Kind of case, and so that's what I meant by the business case. Like I, we couldn't make the business case within Google, or we failed to. But I think it's 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 important that none of us wants the web to evolve based on the business model of any one company, right? I think that's a failure mode for the web. Mm. So you know, having a success story like this, where the where we where we can expand the power of the web, even when none of the browser vendors have a business case for it, I think that's essential. Yeah, and one thing I want to echo um, and highlight is that. Um, Agali did like, you know, one of the things when we were looking at this is the specification wasn't really in a position where it could be you know, interoperably implemented across browsers. Um, one of the web sort of like superpowers is when you can use different technologies together. And MathML wasn't quite in that state yet. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the investment uh, that you know, Galileo put in was actually like writing down and specifying like how to actually render MathML, um, which was you know something that you know I initially thought this is you know the lion's share of the work to be honest, and you know ended up in a really really good situation. One one thing I could also potentially mention as well is that the sort of different you know, the web has lots of different constituencies and like different ways that, you know, you can like prioritize features. Um, and so, you know, there's always this fundamental tension between like, you know, do we work on, you know, it's easily, you know, sitting, you know, in the US or, you know, uh, you know, Western country, uh, you know, with a you know, bachelor's degree or, you know, whatever, uh, you know, wanting better math support, but then there's also, you know, we've got constituencies in, you know, like Southeast Asia, which may not have like great Thai rendering support that we need to weigh against and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so, you know, the history within Chromium with MathMill was, you know, particularly complex as well. We had just forked from WebKit um, at that point in time. And so... Yeah, it, it had just landed like very but, recently... Yeah. The MathML implementation in WebKit was like brand new when Google forked uh, WebKit. And yeah, it, was, it, it, it left some, it left much to be desired. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and you know, part of like part of this, you know, wasn't necessarily like a top concern back then, but was definitely a concern. Is that 
you know, we have now, and we've gotten, gotten better over time, an incredibly high bar for like shipping features that, you know, when we ship a feature, you know, we can stand by it, maintain it. Um, and the quality at that time wasn't there. Um, there was also some fairly big questions about, you know, how this integrates with CSS. I know that there was like a very big like sizing concern mm. um, back then, as well as there was, this was at a time when Google was like aggressively creating new fuzzes against the code to create a more, you know, to close any security gaps. And MathML was a consistent, um, you know, source of fuzzing issues. And that's sort of ultimately, it was complex, but ultimately why it was initially removed from Chromium. Yeah, it was a lot of additional code and a lot of it to do with rendering too, that, you know, if your goal is in part to rewrite the whole thing, um, it makes the most sense to take that new big bundle of stuff off the table initially, at least. So I think it it's not it was not a uh, particularly unreasonable decision at the time. Uh, I know it upset a lot of people, and it it did derail <laughs> MathML because it never managed to uh, get taken back up for these these complex reasons that uh it's hard to do the pr it's hard to prioritize and you know you you have to make a decision uh you have to get it funded but there there are like other modes and ways that this could have also gone i mean svg is the other special one uh egalia is also like uh in a multi-year rewrite of the webkit svg engine <laughs> uh you know because no one has prioritized or done that, like it has all of the same like weird coevolutionary stuff with its own implementation that should be not its own implementation. It should just be part of the platform. So uh, I think this like uh, especially these two are are special and uh, like very deserving of being unweirded and, and like normalized yeah. into the platform. There's also a bit of like history and like how web like web features were previous developed previously being developed whereas where they are now mm -hmm. you know so like back in the day you know this is in the 90s there you know someone had an idea from a for a feature they would implement it uh ship it in a browser and like that would be you know that effectively um you know to a point where and this is a real issue for browsers and you know web developers, frankly, um, where you know even to this day, you know we just have a spec for how you know table out is meant, meant you know is meant to work. Uh, for example, um, it's far from complete, but you know it's taken you know twenty five years to actually have a foundation for how that aspect of layout works. Um, and this isn't you know a criticism of MathML back then. But sort of where, like, we moved uh, as you know a web ecosystem, you know, there's a far higher bar now um, for shipping these things and making sure that they're interoperable. Yeah, I, I mean, there wasn't even there were no there was no such thing as web platform tests back then, right? Yeah. Um, but I there mean, is there there is actually there were like implementation reports and some things that had tests, and this brings me to an interesting little segue here, which is that uh, I didn't even myself know about this, but um, in 2010, I suppose, there is actually a W3C recommendation of MathML for CSS, which was an attempt to uh, sort of reconcile these things. And um, it is interesting that like, at least some of the choices overlap. Um, and uh, there is this test suite from back then. When you look at it, though, and you look at uh, Safari 5.1 at this point scored uh, an 8 out of 100. Oh, wow. uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty interesting. Um, but where all the browsers now are, are scoring uh, really exceptionally well on, on the basic stuff. And then there is the some of the new ways that CSS is, explains and integrate, integrates with MathML um, 
needs to continue to be iterated on in the other browsers. So there's degree of support and, um, you know, now that we have those specifications, um, yeah. and we have an implementation, we need to continue to iterate on those other ones. Yeah. I, I think, I think it, it is important to say that way back in, what was it? 2012, 2013. Um, and even before in 2010, when that CSS attempt was made, um, there are some differences between the way math needs to be rendered, especially with these stretchy characters and the way the rest of the text layout goes. And CSS has made a lot of progress that allows stuff to happen for math that couldn't happen 10 years ago. So I think the time has gotten better in that sense. And there's still some more progress to go. There are a few compromises that are still being made in the um, code um, that hopefully, you know, over time CSS will get better at and those compromises go away. Yeah. Uh, maybe an example of this is that to really render like all the really good math, you, you just need a math font, like you need one. <clears throat> and now there are things we think about with, in terms of securities, we don't want you to know like which particular math font somebody has installed. So, you know, it's, all of these things come together and over many years, then we decide like, ah, oh, what we need is like font family math, right? So you can just say, well, I don't know which mathy one you're going to use, but it needs to be math. So I had all kinds of interesting things over the years that, that come together and make this easier. I mean, even um, midway through this, um, we we're very dependent on layout NG. All that stuff is very invisible to the outside world. And you're like, well, why is it? Why does it take so long? Um, there's lots of dependency. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask about that. When, when Neil was saying, uh, you know, that CSS didn't support this stuff, you know, I, you know, Ian mentioned earlier that uh, that complexity of the code base was a concern as well. And, you know, and, and, you know, layout NG and the other parts of the rendering engine rewrite that happened in Chromium, you know, was that, did, did that change the, the dynamics and the cost benefit trade off significantly? I'm not a, uh, implementer so i couldn't speak to that but from what i gather yeah i think there was a general impression that uh layout ng was pleasant to use i'll i'll take that as a high form of praise um yeah no from reviewing the um the mathml code going into chromium um like everything is very very straightforward from a maintenance point of view um, and this is, you know, one thing that we look at, uh, you know, when introducing new features is, you know, are, are these going to create you know, a massive, you know, headache for us that, you know, we're going to be fixing issues every, you know, every other week um, or crashes or things like that. Um, and the code coming from Megalia, you know, was exceptionally high quality. Um, you know, I you know, you, I know that you have you know plans to continue you know working on Mathemil, but you know for some reason if you didn't, you know, I could feel confident that you know you know the team at Chromium could you know maintain uh, the Mathemil implementation relatively straightforwardly. It wouldn't be a huge additional tax um, on us. So so I think this is a a good time to give a shout out to Frederick Wang who did most of the coding. Um, so I think a big pat on the back or thumbs up to him for um, all the work that he put in. Yeah, Fred Fred is the hero. I think, um, I don't know, I don't know, Ian, if you like want to talk at all about like um, discussions with Fred over the years. Uh, Fred has been a huge, huge champion and uh, also a necessary person in, in convincing that this is a achievable thing. Yeah, I think Fred. Um, you know, we, without the without Fred, we likely you know wouldn't have seen uh, methanol and chromium uh, as quickly you know as we have. Uh, it would have likely taken a fair bit longer. Mm -hmm. um, Fred, you know, was is very very quick to pick up on you know all the minutia in layout. Um, you know, different baselines that you need to deal with, like all the different modes that we use for sizing and measuring things. Um, and, you know, very, very quick to pick up on this. 
and then also had a knack for um, or has a knack for like determining which trade-offs to make um, when there is a trade-off to be made between you know how what the desired outcome for methanol um, is and you know what the sort of platform convention is as well um, and he sort of you know ne ne you know navigated that thread uh, very very well over the past uh, couple of years I agree also I think uh, deserving of a nice shout out is uh, Rob Baus who um, did uh, a big big chunk of the uh, initial work in our prototype and I, I think also also in the code as well uh, I think he contributed a non uh, trivial amount along with Fred um, oh yeah yeah as well no, so together did they you know, great work so I'm really curious Brian if it's okay I'd, I'd love to understand more about how this how it is that it's, this happened and in particular I'm always interested to try to understand like the macroeconomics of how of how the web works. Mm, so, like, yeah. can you share a bit about, like, what do you think it cost Agalia to build MathML? And 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 I guess we're you know I don't know if you want to talk about you know across all the different engines the work you've done and whatnot or Chromium specifically, and and kind of and where did that money come from and why? Right, I think so. It it kind of goes circles back to uh, your original um, question about like, is there a business case there or like why would somebody do this? Why would you prioritize it, et cetera? Right. Um, <clears throat> so Egalia is, uh, for anybody who doesn't know, uh, we're a cooperative. Um, everybody receives, uh, equal pay. We have equal shares. So like we take contracts, money comes in, it gets split equally, but we still have, you know, a business and a budget and all that stuff that we collectively maintain. And one of the things that we do, uh, when we create our budget is, uh, we allow people to submit things that we would like our peers to support from the business standpoint. Uh, and that can be everything from reforestation <laughs> initiatives and, uh, you know, NGOs that uh, we believe you should fund. Uh, and then, you know, collectively, we all agree to take a little less home so that we can fund those things. But we're built on open source and free software, and we are very close to that, that world. We see a lot of the challenges there, missed opportunities and things like that. And so we have the ability to submit uh, for investments, like for things that nobody is currently funding, but we think deserve funding and deserve to move forward somehow. Uh, and the question is like, will we fund it? So you have to write up a proposal. And um, yeah, initially this came up about um, uh, doing some work on MathML in WebKit. Um, that was years ago. Uh, we sponsored all that work, funded all that work, got it done. And then uh, there was a, another effort there to try to drive something forward enough to make a proposal and maybe fund it through uh, grants and crowdfunding. Um, so we did an initial uh, thing based on also writing a grant and getting initial money for the project from uh, the National Institute of Standards Organizations and the Alfred P. P. Sloan Foundation. That was, uh, I think, um, I think that grant was like a hundred thousand uh, dollars. Paid for a big, big chunk of the the prototype and restarting uh, standards proposal efforts and all those things. Uh, then we also uh, got small amounts of funding, like a few thousands from uh, Pearson and APS Physics. Uh, and then there was a period where there was no more funding to be had for uh, about a year, year and a half. And so Egalia stepped back in and funded the work. Um, it slowed down slightly toward the end there, but we kept it going the whole time. Uh, and then we uh, started a uh, open collective, actually uh, after discussion with Neil, who's here with us. Uh, that perhaps we could try this. So uh, through there, we have collected uh, like 
another 75,000, I think, 78, something like that for development on that. And there are people, uh, Rick actually also put some money into that, like sponsored as a person, uh, made a contribution, um, as did I. So yeah, there are uh, a few contributors in there. Two really, really significant ones being uh, Neil Seufer and Murray Sargent, uh, who between the two of them uh, funded $75,000. So that's pretty huge. But yeah, I mean, I, I think this is the the point here is that um, we look for ways to um, diversify and we're completely, constantly you know, looking and trying and trying to raise awareness and make it possible for uh, people to understand and and see business cases and the sort of things that we can do if we take some shared interest in something. We also did our open collective that funded Focus Visible in WebKit the same way. So so this is probably a good point, a good point in time to point out that, um, well, the work's not done yet, right? And so... How is the funding going to happen going that is, forward? That uh, is a really good thing to point out, in my opinion. Well, I can say that uh, there are a lot of people who are interested, who um, are either interested because they think it's the right thing to do, they wish a thing existed, they think it needs priority. Um, and, you know, they can go and talk to their organizations, make the case, uh, but also like even to small amounts, if we just, you know, get together and, and fund things like small amounts collected together go a long way. I mean, I, I joke that, um, when I was a, a, a much younger person and, and Google came along and they did their IPO and they explained how they were going to make their money. I, I laughed. I mean, like it, it seemed ridiculous. Um, it sounds like the plot to Superman three, right? Like we're just going to collect all the little rounding errors together and then we will be billionaires. But that is, I mean, Google makes a lot of money that way, uh, collecting comparatively small amounts, just lots of them. Uh, we can do the same thing through open collective, right? So you could go and throw a dollar a month or $5 a month or $10 a year. Uh, it, it really wouldn't take much for a, a large group to add up. But also these companies like that make education software and make, you know, all, all of the organizations that need math on the web, this is, you know, small marketing dollars to this would be, you know, get you there very quickly. Yeah. So I, I'm kind of curious to see now that, you know, the large base is laid down, whether places say that want to see the textbook publishers, maybe that want to see elementary math supported, that the research community doesn't really care about. It's a smaller ask. And so maybe you'll have more of your traditional Agalia funding model where somebody says, I want to pay for this feature and you guys add it. Do you think that's going to happen? Yeah. I mean, it definitely could happen. Like one, one thing that you see there sometimes once we have a feature that's like in the platform where there's like a browser that like, for whatever reason, can't prioritize that. So like, let's just like, not to pick on anybody in particular, but like, let's just say that like Firefox has a lot of work to do in some things in MathML and they just can't get it prioritized because there's so many other things. And right now they don't have the, the people to do all the things. Um, so it falls to a lower priority. You, if that's the thing that's holding you back, then your company, you know, says, gee, we would sponsor fixing these three bugs or these five bugs or whatever. Uh, that, that definitely happens more with things that are, um, you know, just gaps as opposed to complete missing implementations. But yeah, that I think that is definitely a possibility uh, is another way. In that way, it, it's good in that. Um, I, I don't know if it was Rick that said this before, but like your ability to have a say also like comes with how much are you bringing to the table? Uh, so like if you were me, like, let's say I contribute $5 a month, which is total $80 this year so far uh, to this uh, collective, you know, I don't expect to be able to say what it is that gets implemented in Firefox 
You know what I mean? Like, I, like prioritize, not implemented. Uh, but if you say I'm willing to fund specifically the implementation of, you know, fixing these six bugs in Firefox, then, well, you know, you can have a much more specific say that way. Uh, so if, if that's what you really care about, then you should probably um, either hire somebody, which totally could be a galley. We would love to talk to you or, you know, find a way to make those commits yourself. Well, one thing I want to say on prioritization quickly um, is that, you know, for, for people listening, it really does help um, if you can, you know, Chromium, in the Chromium bug tracker we have, you can start a particular bug. bug. That really, really helps in terms of like prioritization and then actively seeing what issues, you know, people are running to day to day. Um, mm -hmm. For example, you know, one you know, relatively large area of focus um, that we're slowly working on is fixing a whole slew of print bugs and also adding some new print features um, next year as well. Um, and, you know, the reason that we are, like, you know, able to prioritize that work is because in the layout bug tracker, these things surface up into our top 10 bugs, for example. Mm. Um, so, you know, please, you know, uh, Starbucks, if you know they are directly affecting you, it really, really helps. Brian, I, I'm curious to ask more about, you know, related to what Ian's saying. Like, we have all these different ways of prioritizing, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, Neil mentioned that this is like a tragedy of the commons, and you know, how how do we allocate resources in, in a commons? I, I'd love to understand more about this. How Gallia kind of chooses the projects that that you you know you said you choose to to take a little less home in order to invest mm -hmm. in some things. Can you tell more of the story of of how is it that that Agalians got together and said, "Hey, MathML is one of the things that we should fund. Why MathML and and not something else?" And you know, and how do, how do you see this kind of evolving over time? What other sorts of projects might fit that kind of funding model for Agalia? Well, let me start with something that's almost related to what um, to what Ian was saying, which is like uh, it depends what we internally star. So, like Fred was a very active champion of MathML, what's different and unique about this, and then we discuss and vote. Uh, so it's a little bit more, I guess, democratic. Uh, but the first thing is somebody has to propose something, you know? So it starts with people championing it in the first place and, and making the proposal. So, um, you know, when we did our open prioritization experiment, I don't know if anybody remembers that, but... Um, we took six different features that were uh, what you could call like shovel-ready projects. They weren't controversial. They weren't like especially like involved. They're relatively small projects that were relatively uncontroversial. Just for whatever reason, you couldn't get implementation priority on them. Uh, we chose things at different stages of development. So like, is this the, the second implementation or is it the third implementation? Is it the the prototype that has been in specs and is uncontroversial, but nobody has implemented. Uh, we chose some things in CSS, some things in HTML, and then, you know, we put it out there. Here are six things. But, you know, internally, you, you know, there are thousands of things we could have chosen, like literally thousands of things that could have been on our list. So how did we wind up with those six? Well, we had people internally propose and champion them. And then we, you know, chose a, a group that we could put to the public and then the public helped vote with their wallets and said, we think this is the one that you should do and we'll give you $5 or $10 or a hundred dollars. Um, and then we had some organizations that agreed to match funding and things like that. Um, everything gets chosen by in, in some way, you, you need people who are, who are championing it and, and that could be starring a bug or writing about it or tweeting about it or most directly, you know, find the funding for it. That's awesome. Thanks. I don't know if I answered your question really or not, but. I mean, it's just, this is the same conversation you and I have had for years, you know, it's just trying to imagine like, is this could we imagine a world where this scales, you know, where the entire develop, web developer community, for example, is mm -hmm. making pitches and voting on them and, you know, you know, uh, 
trying to prioritize the things and somehow fund the things that would actually bring the most value, you know, biggest bang for the buck for, for you know, for the most people. I don't, it is really tricky actually, um, because sometimes the most valuable changes maybe don't even have the most obvious way to tie back to that. I think off-screen canvas is an example that um, is like MathML in the sense that like, you know, how many people are like, this is the most important thing. Give me this. It's a huge deal. But actually it kind of is a huge deal because there are just like not that many ways that people work with the canvas. And so you can sort of like centralize how many things need to be updated. And then, wow, every single user in real life just gets it. So like, it's very easy to get those improvements to people on all of their mobile devices and their, you know, low end embedded devices and things like that without making like everybody in the universe touch code, you know, like they just can easily get this sort of seamless thing that benefits real actual users. So I don't think that there are a lot of developers out there clamoring for that one, but it has an outsized impact for end users, you know, like all of us. Anybody trying to use a nav system in their car or on their mobile phone, if it's a little bit laggy or whatever, prioritization is different, is difficult. Like it, even given all the exact same inputs, you can see from open prioritization that like one of them won, but it was actually pretty close among like the top three. I think we won't universally agree. Uh, figuring that out is uh, challenging, but the one thing that definitely that definitely works is if you really think that there is a thing that should exist, like finding a way to take the cost of it off the table um, makes that a much easier conversation, right? Like you're not asking everybody else to like to choose A over B. You're saying like, what if we could do A and get it paid for? <laughs> one One side note I'd like to bring up in terms of like prioritization is even when you have the same signals, um, you can sometimes lead you know, to unexpected you know, like results. So you know, one easy example I always bring up for in the Chromium bug tracker is if you've got say a feature, you know, a completely new feature, you know, that has say 30 stars, um, but you have a bug that has you know, a bug that various people are hitting that has 25 stars, that bug is often more important and should be you know, ranked higher, so to speak, just because of you know, how annoying and frustrating it is to uh, people versus that mm. new feature. So even with you know, the same inputs, um, you can, you know, it often leads to you know, different uh, prioritization outputs depending on what you've you know, fundamentally well, I, yeah, what you value. Yeah, I think that's... I, I, making a bit of a guess, but I think that's been one of the problems with um, math implementation is that a lot of programmers have shied away from math. It wasn't one of their top interests. This is just a guess, but, um, you know, uh, Agalia had somebody that was championing it where it was an interest of theirs. And so I suspect Programmer interest is also one of the things that determines when there's a bunch of options available. Uh, if you have some people that are interested in working on it because it's cool and sexy and and fun to do, uh, I suspect that makes a difference too. I mean, I don't think that this is particularly different in even in print. Like if you um, back in the days when like we all went to libraries and bookstores. There's just like, you could walk into a physical space and just seemingly endless amounts of books. And they would be full of predominantly just like the web. Like it's predominantly not math, but that it contains math is really, really important. Right. Um, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's that, different here that um, you shouldn't expect that something needs to be the dominant thing 
uh, in order for it to be really, really important. I think sometimes we fall into a trap, you know, using tools like like our bug stars, or we, you know, we use other data on the Chrome team to try to figure out priorities and whatnot. And and I think it's good because it brings some, you know, rigor and scientific discipline to some of our prioritization. But also, it, it can be a trap to, you know, if if a, what's what's a good Hertz law, right? A good metric, you know, ceases to be a, a good metric if 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 you're I'm going to bungle it. But anyway, if you're over-focused on it, right? And so, like, I love Neil's example of, like, it's easy to say, well, you know, math isn't used that much. And actually, it's okay because mostly people can use images to get around it. I'm actually, I'm really glad that you mentioned that because it's, like, a bit of a misconception. And it is actually a good reason to explain, like, why care. Um, A lot of people would take the approach of putting their math in an image that exists on the web today. Uh, uh, in a bunch of cases, uh, it is not really a good solution. Um, that's because, like, uh, not just accessibility reasons, but the ex- the things that make that an accessibility reason also have like lots of other knock ons. So, um, math is text; it's it's part of every writing system, and text is sort of the web superpower. Almost everything designed around the web is built around these ideas about building trees of text and content and how we style those and make them interactive and uh, like how we deal with things like copy and paste and accessibility. And you, you can't do any of that with images. Uh, Images aren't good to put text in for just so many reasons. Um, They don't take part in styling. So if you happen to be using dark mode, that is going to look real bad. Uh, If you, uh, have styled your text it's not going to participate like you want the text to be blue forget it it's not going to be a lot of math is embedded in text like it's right in the prose uh images are a terrible solution to that uh they cause all kinds of reflow they can be asynchronous they can just drop off and you you don't even know what's supposed to be there if you don't know the aspect ratio that it should be if you haven't accounted for all the ways that this would uh, rescale. Uh, you can create lots of situations where this text is just totally unreadable. So yeah, there's actually a, a ton of reasons why, um, you know, math, a way for the platform to deal with math as text and understand math as text and participate as a, a, a normal participant in all the things that the web does is really important. And that is kind of what MathML does. You know, I, I know MathML is just coming out in Chrome, uh, uh, 109, uh, which is in beta right now, but I was just looking at our, our public use counter stats and it looks like it's in for the population on that beta version of Chrome. It looks like it's already like one in 300 of all page loads are using MathML if the metric is right. And I'd love to just hear like what, what are the actual applications, like deployed applications that you all are most excited about? Who, who do you know that's actually using it, excited or excited to use it more? You know, where, where is I as a, as a browser user Am I likely to, to see this cropping up yeah, more and more over the next year? It's hard to say because it's, so. it's just uh, one of the phrases that I've um, said over the years to try and get people interested is that every day in every classroom from you know K through 12, a kid is sitting down to do math. And the fact that they couldn't really do anything interesting on the web just kind of held back a lot of stuff. But it, if you look now, most of the learning management systems um, all support uh, math in some sense. And via MathJax, which has been a great, uh, great feature to get math out there, um, most of those sites are, are actually you know, using non-images now. It's a big change in the last five years. I'd say probably 80% of the web is now using it. And once MathJax um, switches over to using MathML as a underlying rend- rendering instead of using its current CSS or SVG, it'll be faster. And um, I think people will just appreciate it better. Uh, like Wikipedia has like a few million MathML equations, I think. Do you know, people I use do the know that Wikipedia. Wikipedia or the Wikimedia people are working on putting out native MathML because it's just a better way and faster way to get the math out in the pages. I, I suspect for the, the sort of larger sites, you know, like the Wikimedia folks, um, you know, they will likely, you know, sort of have to do QA, uh, so to speak, of MathML on all of the different browsers um, to see if, you know, they can enable it or whatnot. 
Um, and so, you know, that's sort of where like uh, Agalia's work, you know, over the past couple of years, like actually writing down what should happen for all of these edge cases uh, will go a very, very long way uh, in getting all the browsers to behave the same um, for these different various cases. That all makes a lot of sense. The, the other thing you said that I think uh, is really powerful is, is mentioning uh, libraries like MathJax just being able to upgrade all of their existing users or all the existing use cases, right? We, we worry all the time on the web platform team about, uh, you know, act, how are we actually going to activate new things at scale? You know, once something's built and shipped, it's really hard to get anybody, you know, you can scream until you're blue in the face about how much better it would be if they, if web developers just did something a different way. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, everybody's got to make a cost benefit trade off for their own prioritization. But knowing that MathJax is used all over the place and they can just flip a switch effectively, you know, that, that, that's a really powerful yeah, and I think kind of deployment tool, like, I think. Like Wikipedia, they need to wait to make sure the quality is there in all the browsers. So they, they probably need to see the test results uh, go up a little bit better um, and uh, maybe a few more features, which ones that I've run across, having written some polyfills or transforms to fill in the gap between what is in the full MathML spec and what's in the core implementation is it takes advantage of uh, core's ability to put CSS on the MathML. And that's not yet in all the browser implementations. So it means the polyfills don't work everywhere. So yes, there's definitely more work to be done to align everything uh, onto the same spec. And um, I think that's like the least sexy part of doing anything is to deal with these last, uh, you know, few meters or whatever of implementation. I think though that like the the integration with the sort of CSS engine and whatnot, you know, leads to some really cool use cases. Um, so, you know, for example, you can put, you know, input elements in various text areas uh, inside of MathML code, you can, um, you know, Chrome is currently working on anchor positioning, for example, which lets you position an element relative to another element. So if you, you know, create something that can point to a specific part of the MathML markup, um, you know, things like backgrounds working consistently. And so you can like, you know, highlight or, you know, style various parts of the equation. Um, I think that should lead to some pretty interesting use cases um, if people you know, experiment. Yeah, and it. just, I mean, just being able to mouse over something and have a tooltip pop up that explains the math and that has some math inside of it. So that would be great. Neil and Brian, and especially Neil, you've been working on MathML for a long time. You know, are, are you, how, I, I hope you're feeling some uh, sense of satisfaction and accomplishment. Sounds like a long probably frustrating uh, journey. Yeah, and as I said, I'm glad to see that I've lived long enough to see it show up in all the browsers. Um, <laughs> it was it was seeming a little bit touch and go whether that would actually be the case. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm greatly relieved. Um, I have to say, having seen MathML show up briefly and then disappear, there is still a little bit of fear uh, that something's going to happen to cause it to go away again. I don't know what would that would be. I, I certainly hope it's not going to happen. And I know the community will greatly benefit from this. But I, I also realize that, as we've discussed, the uptake won't be immediate. People have to get a sense that it's here for real, that it's interoperable, that it's high quality. And that just takes a little bit of time um, to happen. And I think uh, part of that is it disappeared once. So now they have to make sure that it doesn't disappear a second time before they have that confidence to really go ahead and use it. So I suspect even though it's coming out now, um, it may be a year or two before it's really adopted widely. Um, but we'll see. Maybe a little have instant uptake. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, congratulations again. It really does feel like, you know, to, to Neil's point about, you know, there's still some risk here. It really does feel to me like you've been pushing this boulder up the hill for 25 years. And yeah, there's a lot more distance to cover, but now you're covering the distance on the other side of the hill. 
it, it does feel like this is now probably almost certainly part of the web forever now. Yeah, I think it's it's really great to be at this moment where we like achieve this thing that seemed unachievable yeah. and uh, also to recognize that, you know, there's a lot more climbing to yeah. do. So I, again, I want to thank all the work that you and the rest of the Gallia have done because, um, you know, some people have funded a little bit, uh, but a has put in a lot and they've done it with their uh, time and expertise. And most of the other people have just sat back and, you know, maybe gave a little money and otherwise um, cheered you on. Yeah, huge, huge congratulations to uh, Fred and Rob and uh, everyone else who uh, helped make it happen in the end. Yeah, and uh, I think huge thanks to the community group who then became the working group in getting all that started uh, again because uh, <clears throat> it was not easy work. Um, there's a, a lot of volunteers who came and um, gave a lot of time to figure out and debate things. And and to be clear, some like not easy questions as well. It wasn't just oh, let's just write down you know whatever Firefox was doing previously or whatever you know WebKit was doing previously. Uh, there was a lot of nuance um, and complexity that needed to be sorted. I think one potential example you know, which springs to mind um, is. Yeah, and this isn't you know throwing Firefox under the bus or anything like that. It's just you know what was implemented way back when, is that if you you know added like one additional element or you know, didn't have the right number of elements under a certain um, tag type, for example, it would then just you know go whoop to the whole formula. Nope, sorry, we're not rendering this. Um, huge error type of thing. Um, so there was you know a lot of a lot of complexity to be worked through about what to do for these you know, edged and failure cases and how to fall back gracefully. Yeah. For example. I think ultimately we got to a very simple solution and uh, one that's uh, you know pretty predictable, well, is very predictable and uh, is a good one. Yeah. I just wanted to say thanks again, everybody, for coming on and chatting with me on this episode to celebrate uh achieving this thing and uh yeah thanks so much th th thank you for, for yeah, having us thanks. um this was a lot of yeah. fun and, and congratulations yes, again thanks yep thanks a lot <laughs>